Okay, we're back live here in Las Vegas. This is Silicon Angles, the Cube, our flagship program. We've got the advanced extracted signal from the noise. This is HP Discover. This is Las Vegas. Day two of three days of wall to wall live coverage. I'm John Furrier, founder of Silicon Angle, and I'm joined with my co host. I'm Dave Vellante of Wikibon.org. Nick Iliadis is here. He's the CTO of Broadcom. Hardened Cube guest, Cube alum. Nick, welcome back. <laughs> Glad to be here. <laughs> Excited. Hardened the Cube alum. <laughs> <laughs> so, you guys have had a great relationship with HP for a long, long time. You're the you know, default adapter in, in Gen 8. Um, so another, yet another HP Discover. Yes. So talk about the relationship a little bit. What's yeah. that mean to Broadcom? So uh, Broadcom has had a very long relationship with uh, HP. Actually, we're on our 13th generation of, of uh, Ethernet controller, and HP has been our, a customer at Broadcom for most of those generations. So it's, uh, it's been a long relationship. And you know, we provide, uh, you know, after 13 years, or 13 generations, the software quality and the software performance is key, because you know, HP knows that we deliver uh, performance and quality in our, our products, so that's, that's key to the relationship. In, in, in terms of performance, uh, you know, we have offload technology in our controllers, which is, in terms of FCOE and iSCSI, is the best in the industry. And I think you'll see some of that uh, in some upcoming uh, products that are yet to be announced uh, from HP. So 13 generations. So so you talk about the quality. So so talk about that a little bit more. Um, you know what does that mean for customers in terms of you know what, do you, what does that mean quality? Is that maturity of the the hardened stack? Uh, is it does it create a barrier of entry uh, for for the competition? Does it give you competitive advantage? Does it allow you to keep your costs down? What, what are the what are the benefits? You for know, customers? quality has has many facets. Right. I mean, first of all, is hardening, meaning that the the, the software is been field tested over multiple generations. It has features that allow you to diagnose the operation of the network, so it actually allows you to have visibility. Um, it is feature rich, as, as over 13 generations, you, you get feedback from the customers, you incorporate that into your software, and that creates a much more uh, valuable asset for deploying. And, and HP sees that, because when, when they deploy our, our products, the customers have familiarity with it, they've been using it for many years, and if there's an issue, you know, we are very responsive to go out and, and fix it for them. So the you know, responsiveness is another part of quality as well. And then um, the fact that they're using it as a default adapter, I think, speaks to that as a, you know, as how they view it as well. Nick, Nick I want to ask you, we just had um, access data on, they do, a, you know, they got partner of the year for security, um, and we were talking about that, um, the challenges in, in cybersecurity. Right. Um, what are you guys doing relative to uh, Security threats, and obviously, when you get down into the you know the hardware, you get some code. There's cryptography. There's all kinds of new algorithms, new performance levels. Right. What's Broadcom up to around security? Well, um, our controller products that go into service don't really have a security aspect to them, other than you know being able to set up some authentication and things like that. But in you know the broader Broadcom portfolio, we do have you know, encryption, crypto capabilities that are. Uh, best in class in terms of performance. Uh, we have some uh, multi-core processors that have, we just announced actually uh, this week at the Lindley conference, that provide 100 gig of crypto in line. 100 gig, that's, that's uh, best what in does class. That, what does that mean for the people who don't know know what that how, what that means in terms of capabilities? Uh, in terms of 100, 100 gig of crypto, you could probably encrypt uh, multiple uh, enterprises in in terms of their traffic, let's say like a, a bank, you know, like a dozen banks without breaking a sweat. I mean, it's, it's that kind of- All traffic. All the traffic, wow. every, every bit. Yeah. And that's because of the, the cores? The cores, yeah, so this is a multi-core processor and it has accelerated on chip as well, so it's, it's very key uh, technology. And it's, it's actually the highest performing multi-core processor in the industry. Wow, obviously Meg Whitman's getting behind security, Dave. We heard that yesterday in the keynote. Um, that, that's always an interesting conversation. I mean, the, you know, software on a chip, Things are getting embedded in, and is that, is that more of the trend now? I mean, we're hearing breaking down the silos from IBM, from HP, all the different vendors are trying to collapse and not have separate products and boxes. Is the trend more software getting in, embedded in and abstracting away some of the, the, the deep tech? What do you um, see there in that trend there? So, the, you know, software obviously on chip is a is a key attribute of, of what we do, right? Um, and, and, and actually, our, our controllers, the the adapters that go into the uh, HP servers are actually based on a very long word risk processor. So one of the reasons we have 
so much flexibility in our controllers is because they are actually programmable. They're not a state machine driven controller where you know once they leave the factory, it's, everything they can do has been dictated. They actually, these controllers actually run code on them at very high rates to. So that's going to be really hit the trend for dynamic policy, right? Right. That's really the and upgradability. So you can now upgrade the controller in the field with new features after it's already been shipped. Dave and I were hearing that all week, uh, last week, dynamic is, is the way static policy is dead. That's what people are talking about. Nick, um, you know, SDN's obviously the big buzzword we covered you know, extensively on SiliconANGLE and, and Wikibon. You know, uh, VMware's acquisition of Nicera, of course, you know, started uh, uh, all the buzz you know, around it. Talk about, from a CTO's perspective, what's different about network virtualization? We're all familiar with with, with virtualizing compute, right. uh, and you know, everybody knows servers were underutilized, big consolidation play. Networking's different. Uh, ports are oversubscribed; they're not underutilized. So, how is uh, SDN network virtualization? How is that all evolving from a CTO's perspective? How is it different? So, I, I look at SDN as, as network orchestration, being able to orchestrate your network holistically, and be able to automate the provisioning of you know, uh, machines, virtual machines, and be able to move, you know, B-Motion and, and, and all that, uh, machines in the network, and have the network move with them, meaning the, the network reconfigures itself through software commands that track the movement of one virtual machine from one server to another, or you bring up a virtual machine on one server that wasn't there before, and the network has to be able to recognize and uh, provide the proper virtualization underneath. And what ends up happening is when you have multiple virtual machines on a single server, that network has to be able to, to take their traffic and break it into different uh, virtual tunnels so that you maintain separation. So if you're a multi-tenant type of environment, you have three virtual machines that belong to three different tenants, you don't want their traffic to intermingle. So the network has to be able to keep that traffic separated and, and deliver it to where it belongs. So that's the challenge for, for network virtualization is being able to keep all the traffic going from where it belongs and not have it bleed over into other uh, tenants uh, traffic and do it with uh, an SLA. So if you're providing hosting services and say I'm going to give you a gigabit of service, you want to make sure that your network recognizes that virtual machine, sets up a virtual connection to it, and then provides a, a gigabit of service just for that you know, virtualized part of the connection, not just the entire connection. So you're talking about uh, uh, an automation component and you're talking about this noisy neighbor problem. Because <laughs> today, you know, network management is obviously very labor intensive, right? So the promise of SDN is is that labor component gets reduced dramatically. I mean, how, how dramatic will that be? I think there's a, uh, an order of magnitude reduction in uh, how the network provision. In the past, you would go out and do element management. You would go to a box and say, I want to configure this port for these VLANs, or I'm going to set up a, a certain traffic management attribute. So what SDN does is it creates a platform that the network is viewed as holistic, and you are able to go out and you know, provide commands to the, to the network that is interpreted by the different elements, and they basically do what the orchestration tells them to do. So I think this is the evolution of how networks get managed versus being element managed, they're now being managed as a fabric, managed as, in, 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 as a whole entity versus individual boxes. I wonder if we could talk about network performance a little bit. Um, we talk a lot about, about flash, you know, mechanical disk, the last moving piece of uh, computing systems. And you know, flash uh, allows that to go away. That's good news, bad news is now it changes, shifts the bottleneck mm -hmm. to the network. That's where you guys come in, Correct. presumably. So talk about how you affect right. performance and maybe some of the trends you're seeing in terms of you know, technology uptake, 10 gig, 40 gig, et cetera. So the first trend that we're seeing is the adoption of 10 gig. Uh -huh. So you know, um, up until the Romney cycle, uh, gigabit was the predominant technology being used to connect servers to the network. We're now seeing that 10 gigabit is starting to rise uh, to double digits. And uh, another piece of the 10 gig technology that's enabling this is 10 G base T. So this is 10 gig running over uh, twisted pair cabling that was used for one gigabit server. So now a network administrator can add new servers to an existing network and, and deploy a switch that can both tie their legacy one gig servers to the network as well as their 10 gig Without servers. ripping and replacing that like, infrastructure. Other than just that one switch. All the wiring yeah. stays the same. Now that 10 gig performance now allows you to take media that was typically in a DAS, direct attached storage, sitting inside the server, move it to the network, and still have that level of performance be there. 
because the network now is as fast as that local bus was inside that server. Excellent. Um, how about, uh, let's talk a little bit about Moonshot. We're hearing a lot about Moonshot at this uh, event. Yeah, Dave Donatelli just came by and was very excited. Um, we are too. So what, 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 why are you excited about Moonshot? Well, Moonshot, first of all, it, it changes the uh, server paradigm in the, in the way that says that we're going to have these cartridges that are purpose-built versus having the general purpose servers and these purpose-built cartridges have different attributes that you can then you know, deploy X of this and Y of that and have a, a server complex that has different capabilities based on how you deploy these cartridges and, and give it flexibility. Also, Moonshot in itself is a very networked box because all those cartridges have to talk to each other as well as the network. So, you know, if somebody goes over and takes a, a peek at the, net, at the Moonshot box, I think they'll be surprised at how much Broadcom content. That's why you're excited, <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> well, it's, 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 it's actually a, you know, a, a very nice uh, evolution of the server complex and how it gets deployed in the network. I mean, the numbers are staggering in terms of what they're saying, HP.com, yeah. and what they're, what they're powering it on. Um, the question I want to get your thoughts on as, you know, as a technical person, especially at Broadcom, because you have exposed to so many things at a root level as well as the market forces, is the Internet of Things. Yes. You guys uh, have a view on that. What's your take on the Internet of Things? It's going to throw off a lot of data. Dave and I were just debating this the other day. Um, how much data will actually be thrown off? Is it little data? I mean, it's trickling data. Is it probes? What is an Internet of Things? Is it kind of a sensor on a refrigerator an Internet of Things? Yeah. Is you know, living room devices? Uh, to big turbines, factories, nuclear plants. I mean, it's actually all of those things. Wait, I mean, so <laughs> share with us your yeah. vision of Internet of Things from a technical perspective and how the market plays. Certainly, it. it's, it's actually very exciting because it, it now takes this this network environment that we all live in with our with our smartphones and computers and takes it and embeds it deeper into the fabric of society. So now you have, like I said, refrigerators, cars. I think automotive is automotive is the one real killer app in my mind of, of the Internet of Things. You can track traffic. You can, see whether your car's oil's burning, you know, all these things. Yeah. That do, amazing things. Amazing things. And now, so you have this wireless infrastructure that can reach out and, and pull this information in, but then you need the network fabric behind it to be able to bring it to where it needs to go to be processed. But there's also uh, an angle of this that says, we want to really uh, filter how much of that data gets to, to the core because a lot of it's redundant. So you want to have intelligent edge. So I call this the intelligent edge of the network that pre-processes the Internet of Things data, and then pre presents something that's a little bit more maybe some metadata. Metadata, <laughs> that's a good word. <laughs> to the, to the, the, the analytics that, part yeah. of the. I think the, the New network. York Times just had a story about metadata. Okay. 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 It's something else. Which in we'll the talk headline, about. right? We're in the headline, <laughs> metadata, metadata. <laughs> talking about the NSA thing. We'll get back to that yeah. in a second. Continue. <laughs> You're on a roll. Yeah. So, so the the network has to become uh, intelligent at its edge to be able to provide the, the analytics, the important data, not the redundant data. So, I think there's going to be a an architecture that says we're going to have wireless and some wired. You know, the fabric has to be aware, right? The fabric has to be aware. So there's an edge, there's a, it's a handshake, if you will, yes. going on between the pre And there's location services are required because some of this stuff doesn't sit still, right? It, these things move, right? Yeah. So you have to be able to know where they are, how fast they're moving, and what they're doing. So there's there's a lot of What other kind of data scale are we talking about? I mean, talking about large scale data being thrown off or just little lightweight pieces that in the aggregate make up a massive pile. Exactly. It's a law of large numbers, right? <laughs> you know, little things times a million becomes big things, right? So it, it, it will yeah. become a lot. And I think, how real is Internet of Things in your mind? I mean, obviously, what you just walked through okay. was actually an architecture. I can take my, my phone out and I can tell you where my car is right now and what the alarm system of my car is doing because my car has a GSM radio in it. So my car is always communicating with the network and telling the world, or me, my alarm is armed, the hood is, is closed, the engine's off. So I'm already living the Internet of Things with my. Soon you'll be taking video to people <laughs> checking out your car, or you know, walking Actually, around your I car. Actually, I probably could. <laughs> <laughs> so obviously, you know, uh, my son just graduated high school. He's at Palo Alto High School, and he was the only first graduate to walk down the aisle with Google Glass. And so, you know, I gave him my development kit that I got yep. as part of Google I/O as a gift, yep. so he can play with it and kind of you know imagine the future. Because really, what that is, it, it's if you think about what that's doing, that could be peering with other devices. So right. I have a wearable glasses that could be talking to my Fitbit, yep. my phone. My phone becomes the base station of my personal yep. devices. So in a sense, it's a personal area network. Yep. That has to connect to a fabric. But if I interact with other things, then it's a whole nother, yep. is it a mesh network? Or so, so it brings up network stuff. Um, yeah, because you have to communicate it. At the end of the day, the, the glasses are not very interesting if they don't aren't able to get data. I mean, I have the, my killer app for the Google Glasses. 
I don't know if you're interested in hearing Yeah, I'd love to. So I walk into a room full of people, and my glasses identify all the people, tell them what their names are and, and what they do. So now no longer do I have to like fish for business cards to try to figure out, is that John, is that Richard? The glasses yeah. do it for me. Yeah, it pulls up the cute videos. <laughs> <laughs> so um, so let's nice. talk about the NSA thing since we brought that up. Um, obviously, um, that is awakening America to what we know in the geek world, yeah. tech world as, you know, Network surveillance. It's been network yeah. management. It's been around for years. I've always assumed that anything I do on the internet, somebody's going to see. So. Yeah, yeah. And we had guys off the record tell us that's the tip of the iceberg. And there's a lot more that we don't know about. So, so you know, the word metadata is educating the world. Do you? What's, what's your take on that whole scandal, that whole leak, the whole spying? Um, obviously, I think Google and Yahoo are not doing deals with the government. I'm sure the government has requests. Yeah. Google's clarified, overamplified that, you know. They're clean, so to speak, yeah. and it's just, it seems to be blown out of proportion. What's your take on all that? Well, I mean, I really have no first-hand knowledge of what NSA or, or, or the FBI were, were doing, but if you look at where we are today as a society, we share information openly, right? Google knows who I am, what I'm searching for, my bank knows what I'm buying, my visa purchases. If we're assuming any level of, of privacy in, in this world, you have to take action to, to make sure. If you don't want to have people know or organizations know what you're doing, you have to be proactive. And just, you know, so I think people have to assume that unless you do something, the information about what you're doing will be known. That's a good point. The people that want to make money That's a good point. A lot more is known about us than who we're calling on yes. a cell phone. Yeah, exactly. Uh, right. We, we, we always say that American Express knows more about us and you know, Safeway, where I shop, knows yeah. all my habits. <laughs> exactly. They have all that data. So, I mean, it's, this, it is what it is. Yeah. And, and the thing is that I don't know if we have... The, the broad society is aware of it, but obviously us as technologists are aware of what you can do. I mean, you can easily tap traffic in on a switch and say I'm going to redirect it before it hits the Google or somebody else's servers, peel it off. I mean, that's unfortunately very easy to do. You guys are also involved in the media business. Obviously, you power a lot of the networks for media companies. Um, what do you think about the whole video, uh, YouTube, social media, cable TV, you have in-home, all, all the signals now over the air are mm -hmm. now coming back right. into vogue. Uh, is this going to be multiple technologies just converged in one screen? Tablet? I mean, the, con the connected home you're talking yeah, about? Yeah. The, 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 connected the, the, home. The connected home. Um, I think we're going to see a, a, a lot of these uh, companies that provide you services like uh, the, the Comcast of Verizons, they try to actually provide you a turnkey uh, experience in the home, that instead of having to be this guy that, that you know takes something like an X10 and, and a smart TV and a, and a set-top box and tries to figure out how to make it all work together, I think you're going to see the service providers come in and say, I can turnkey, you know, temperature control, home automation, and all the, you know, the, the you know, music in every room, and do it for you, versus you have to be the... Have you seen the uh, the Nest product? The, yes. Uh, the, the, I mean, the, that's, the product. that's pretty elegant. It is, yes. Do you have one? Uh, no, unfortunately, my heating system is not compatible, <laughs> but I have something I jury rate myself. So. <laughs> oh, you built your own. Your CTO you built your own. I don't yeah, mean no, that. No. But that's but, that, out in the basement. Yeah, but that's interesting. Yeah. That's basically uh, designed for user experience. Yes. It's designed to be like very Star Trek like, yeah. you know, yeah. not just temperature control, but like an iPod. Exactly. And handling a lot of And it has an app on, on an iPad. Yeah. So it's very Self discovery, very a lot of software written. Very elegant product. We're watching that at Nest. Nick, thanks for coming on theCUBE. Really pleasure. appreciate it. Uh, one, love talking about Broadcom, but more importantly, love to tap your, your expertise and just get a sense of what's happening in the trends. Really appreciate it. This is theCUBE. I'm John Furrier with Dave Vellante. We'll be right back with our next guest after this short break. Thank you.